Ah, it's not in. <laughs> For the record, he didn't find that. I did. <laughs> but he pushed the button. <laughs> no, it was on. The pack was on. It just, you got to be plugged in. It's got to all be together. You know, it's, it's all, all thing. But I do want to, what I was saying is that, thank you for your prayers, brother. But I, and, I, and I do want to echo the thankfulness for what we sing. Um, you know, the songs we sing are unlike anything we sing any other time. And it doesn't, again, it doesn't mean that you can't enjoy other, you know, any other type of music is inherently wrong. Uh, I'll say this, I can't stand country music or rap music. That's Jeff. Amen, brother. <laughs> but, but there's nothing inherently wrong with the genre of music, the lyrics, the lyrics, the lyrics are different, but you can sing, you know, and enjoy some other things. I like to, when it's just me and Rena, just sing some, some old, you know, old love songs to her, you know, uh, and and her her undying love for me proves that she does love me because she stays around, she hangs around, she doesn't run screaming out of the house and leaving, but. When you're looking, I, I hope that when we're singing the songs we're singing, it's the lyrics. It's those lyrics that are so different. The world can't sing anything like it. It can't. And um, so I pray we're, we're letting those sink in as, as, as we sing them. Granted, there are going to be some tunes that are more attractive to us than others, and that's a good thing. That's a fine thing. Uh, but anyway, uh, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want us to open back up to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Our focal verse is going to be verse 30. But again, for context sake, um, I want to uh, just begin again in verse 22 and read through the end of the chapter. Again, focusing on his request in Verse 30, he says, For this reason I have often been prevented from coming to you. He's, he's noting here a struggle that he, is, he has experienced in time and space of his desire to come to the Romans, to visit the Roman church there at Rome. But now with no further place for me in these regions, and since I have had for many years a longing to come to you whenever I go to Spain, for I hope passing through to see you, and to be helped on my way there by you when I have first enjoyed your company for a while. But now, why, now I am going to Jerusalem to serve the saints. For Macedonia and Achaia were pleased to share with the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. Yes, they were pleased to do so. And they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have shared in their spiritual things, they are indebted to minister to them also in material things. Therefore, when I have completed this, and have put my seal on this fruit of theirs, I will go on by way, by way of you to Spain. And I know that when I come to you, I will come in the fullness of the blessing of Christ. Now I urge you, brothers, by our Lord Jesus Christ and by the love of the Spirit, to strive together, engage in combat with me in your prayers to God for me that I may be rescued from those who are disobedient in Judea, and that my service for Jerusalem may prove acceptable to the saints, so that I may come to you in joy by the will of God and find rest in your company. Now may the God of peace be with you all. Amen. I have entitled this week's message a simple title of prayer, Inexplicable Power. Inexplicable Power. As I said last week, prayer for the Christian plays a definitional role in terms of all the aspects or facets, if you will, of what it means biblically to be a true and faithful follower of Christ. It can't be separated from what we call Christianity. It cannot. 
though it is all too often too much absent. I made much ado last week about the phrase, your prayers, in verse 30. And so what I wanted us to see primarily last week on this point was that Paul was imploring these fellow Roman believers <clears throat> excuse me, to take upon them specific requests before God on his behalf in a prayer life. Remember that Paul assumes... By the nature of how he has written this, he is assuming that it is already in existence in their lives. Prayer. This is something that is habitually there. It is a normal thing. It is something that is well familiar to them. He's not, he, he isn't asking them to initiate a new a practice or discipline that didn't already exist in their lives. The prayers Paul speaks of here are those he is assuming to belong to. It's very personal to the people he is writing to. And are sourced in these fellow believers, both individually and corporately. So he's writing to them as you read throughout this letter. It's, it's all to be taken on a personal level. It is also all to be taken on a corporate level. And so when it comes to these prayers, he is making an appeal not only to that congregation in Rome, but he's making this appeal to every single believer in that church. Therefore, it is to be sourced in the church. Yes, it's something that's supposed to be springing out of, flowing out of, but it, it only does that because it is flowing out of every individual believer in that church. One possibility in this scenario regarding these particular Roman Christians is that the prayer lives of some in that congregation, which is pretty consistent with every congregation, and, it, that, and that may be that they're, they're, this issue of prayer is a point of weakness in their lives. And by engaging their consciences to pray on his behalf, he is initiating by such request Somewhat of a catalyst, if you will, a spark to ignite in them a more vibrant prayer life by, by engaging them in prayer on his behalf and thereby strengthening the church here in Rome. This is one of the reasons why it is something of vital importance among the believers when we're gathering together, particularly in our smaller groups, uh, in our growth groups on Wednesday nights. Uh, that when, when, we're, when we're gathering around, as TJ was referring to earlier, we, we're together. If there's a burden, man, we've got something on our hearts. It's a good thing to come before our brothers and sisters and ask them to pray for us. Because I want to tell you something. One of the things that happens there is that somebody, a brother or sister, may be in the moment. They may have been stronger in the past, but they may be in the moment. Weak, neglecting of their own prayer time. But out of the love that God has put in our hearts because of the Holy Spirit in us, and a love, just that, that inherent Christian love for one another, we are then, maybe, maybe I've been weak lately. Maybe I've been neglecting. I've been allowing, allowing busyness to just get hold of me. But you come to me and you're saying, with a burden on your heart, like what we see here Paul doing, and you say, I need prayer for this. And I'm moved in that moment. To say, let us pray. By that very act, you coming to me, you may have just kick-started, renewed a prayer life in me. And this is a possibility of what Paul is doing as a leader with this church. Knowing that there are likely those who have a strong prayer life, but where this letter is going to be read, there may be those in that congregation that might be just a little neglectful or just plain out weak in that area. And by giving them this appeal, he is initiating, he is igniting in them even something that's going to strengthen them in their faith. One thing is for sure, that's speculation, to be honest with you. That's speculation. It's a possibility just knowing the nature of all churches that I know of and human beings and myself. That's speculation. One thing we do know for sure here, Paul is desiring without a doubt to see the power of God working through the prayers of the saints on his behalf and on behalf of the church when he's making this request here. 
I want you to hear this if you hear nothing else. So much so, I'll put this as a slide. You need to hear this if you hear nothing else this morning. God has chosen to empower His people and His church through prayer. It was His sovereign choice to do so. I believe it is, again, the most universally overlooked and underestimated and therefore underused or even abused gift that God has ever given to His people. We take it for granted as though it's not a gift. It's a gift. We aren't owed this ability to talk to Almighty God anywhere, anytime, under any circumstances. But we tend to behave as though it's just it's something that was automatic. It was something that just was due of us. I want to say this right up front. I'm going to cover a lot of ground this morning, but we're not going to be finished with this issue of prayer because I see, I see it as the one thing, the one thing that makes us the weakest. Even when you have the Word of God as central in a congregation where there is a weak prayer life that springs from that knowledge of the Word of God, you still have a weak church. As we noted last week, there are pre-qualifications to what it means to pray properly before the Lord. And first and foremost is that we are praying according to His will as we pray in His name. Praying in His name according to His will, we, we saw last week, means that we are fulfilling the role as His ambassadors on this earth. We are not here to carry out our own wills, but His will alone. We are to be completely and totally submitted to what His will for our life is. I'm just going to say this to you. When we are, we will find ourselves devoid, emptied of, purged of the tendency to be jealous of other people, envious of other people and their place and status in life. We will find ourselves to be much more content with our own state in life when we are trusting God to be following and submitted to His will, to play the part He has called us to play in this life, in this time. This comes from having an eternal perspective, not a temporal perspective. But when we look at it, again, being this ambassador, really, here in this world for Christ, it is backed up by Scripture. Paul himself, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 21 here, he says, Now all these things are from God. What things? If you go back and read that entire chapter, we're talking about the things of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of salvation through Jesus Christ. So now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their transgressions against them. What a blessing that is. Not counting my transgressions against me. Not counting, uh, he has committed us to us the word of reconciliation. So then, verse 20 here, we are ambassadors for Christ. As God is pleading through us, we beg you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not in us, in him. Whether it was Paul's intent to instigate through his pleading for the Romans to pray on his behalf an ignition to start a fire of prayer, burning in these brothers and sisters or not, whether that's the case or not, getting them to pray for him as a brother in Christ for the purpose of the kingdom of God would potentially have had the effect in them when they got this letter of lighting that fire. It's much like our physical human bodies. If we don't work them, they get weak and atrophy, right? If we do work them, we tend to, at a minimum, at least to maintain the strength that we have. If we're, if we're pushing them a bit and eating properly, feeding our bodies properly, they tend to get stronger. 
It just depends on how much, you know, we push them and, and what we're feeding them. But if, 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 if we're humans, as humans, one thing is for sure. If we're, not, if we're not working our bodies and we're not feeding them properly, they will weaken. They will atrophy. They will then be susceptible to all the, the attacks of the environment on us. So too are we sustaining our strength or gaining in strength in our spiritual lives through our prayers and feeding on the word of God. Now the disciples saw this in our Lord. When they're observing his life, the power of Christ's own ministry here on earth seemed to emanate in their minds from his prayer between he and his father. In Luke chapter 11, verse 1. I love this. I've always loved this ever since, I've, ever since I ever saw this in reading my Bible. And it says, And it happened while Jesus was praying in a certain place. After he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. They're kind of pulling the, you know, well, everybody else kind of thing is, is you know, well, Lord, he, you know, he did it for them. We see you engaging in this prayer feverishly, really. We're seeing the power of godliness in your life, the power in your life, this impact that this seems to be having on your life, Lord. We're seeing that. And we know that John taught his disciples a different way to pray, a new level of praying here. Lord, will you teach us to pray? This, in my experience, is one of the most unasked, yet most pressing questions in the hearts of many Christians. And that is, how do I pray? How do I pray? When I finally do get that question, oftentimes from Christians... Uh, young believers in Christ most of the time, um, it's a pleading question. I, 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 I hear you talking about praying, but how do I pray? I hear you praying in public, but that seems to be different a little bit from what you're praying, you're talking about in your private prayers. True. True. Luke records here that it, 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 it wasn't even all the, all the disciples asking the question. He records here in 11.1 that it was one, one of them asked. I can assure you this. I have no doubt whatsoever that when he asked the question, every ear of every one of those disciples perked up and they locked in and they listened to what he had to say in reply. Being devout Jews, every one of these, these disciples at this point would supposedly have known to how to pray. It, 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 it was just part of their Jewishness to pray. If you question that, all you have to do is take a look at the Western Wall in Jerusalem of the Temple Mount. Right now today, there are just scores of Jews out there fervently praying. While denying the Lord, the Messiah, they are fervent in prayer. And this is a practice that, that has existed throughout Judaism. But no one, these disciples, had ever seen lived in such a godly way, in such godly power as Jesus did. And they knew somehow that his prayers were a source of what they were observing in his life. Now, you may be, you may be sitting there going, well, of course not. I mean, <laughs> no one is going to be as godly as Jesus because he is God, right? True. But he was living out the life of a human being on this earth to fulfill his mission to save a fallen humanity as a man. And this required perfect obedience in being perfectly human. So he modeled perfect humanity even in his prayer life. Notice that I said perfect humanity there. One thing that will be present in our prayers that was not present in his prayers because of his perfection was the confession of sin. It was never there in his. Mary, though she is deified to a certain degree by certain people, she prays 
she speaks of her need for a savior because she was a sinner. No matter what anybody says, she was born in sin. Jesus Christ is the only human that never needed to pray a confession of sin. And this is why what we call the Lord's Prayer is more aptly named the Disciples' Prayer. <clears throat> because after observing, again, the power of prayer in their Lord's life and then asking Him to teach them to pray, Luke records his answer there in, in Luke 11 as a concise rendition of what we call the Lord's Prayer from His Sermon on the Mount message in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, <clears throat> which included... Again, the Lord's Prayer, verses 9 through 13 of Matthew chapter 6. That prayer includes a confession of sin. To read it in its entirety, there in Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, <clears throat> Jesus says, Pray then in this way, Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Something to note here is that though this prayer, as it is written, is a great prayer to be praying verbatim. Verbatim, just as, just as it's written. And many of us, especially who maybe have a little again, of this arctic blonde uh, coming in on, on our, our hair color change. Uh, many of us my age and older grew up in athletics. You learned, whether you were Christian or not, whether you went to church or not, it was just a normal thing. If you were on a baseball team or a football team, you learned, you said the Lord's Prayer. Most of the time at practices, almost every time at a game, before or after a game. It was our benediction. And with some of the teams I played on, we needed a lot of prayer. Should have been praying a lot more. But this, ver this to be learned ver verbatim is, again, valuable. I think, it is, I think it is a good thing for us to learn. I think it's something that we have lost in our culture and in our society. In fact, in the early church... And an early church writing, one of the earliest church writings that we have is called the Didache, meaning the teaching. It's not a long read. You can look it up online, D-I-D-A-C-H-E, Didache. Uh, but in there, there's an address of prayer and there's, there's an, an admonition there, an exhortation really, for, the, for Christians, for the church, to pray that specific prayer three times a day. Every day, which is fine if, if you want to do that. But the scriptures don't command us to do that. In fact, what we see here is Jesus says, pray in this manner. Hutos, pray in this manner, thusly, in this way. In other words, contained in this prayer that Jesus gives, this model prayer, are elements of prayer that we would do best to implement in our own prayer lives in a manner that if our overall prayer life were to be examined. If somebody were going to take all of our prayers and record all of them, but unbeknownst to us, known to us, just maybe that private prayer, take them and record them in written form, audio, whatever, look at them, overall, they're going to see these elements constantly woven through our prayer life. Not necessarily all the time in every single prayer, every time you pray, are you covering all of these elements? But one of those, as I have mentioned, is a confession of sin. That verse 12 there, where Jesus says, he says, pray this, or in this way, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. I, I want to begin there with this aspect of our Lord's instructions to pray, because it helps us to maybe get our hearts and minds on our need for the Lord by bringing a certain soberness to our approach to Him. As David's prayer in Psalm 51 was read uh, earlier, King David there in that prayer, verses 1 through 17, is confessing before God his guilt and his need for forgiveness. In verses 1 through 4, if you recall, 
For the choir director, again, given that background here, a psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This was that adulterous relationship. David prays, Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the abundance of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, an iniquity that exists, that is real, that he is acknowledging, he is confessing. And cleanse me from my sin, for I know my transgressions. This isn't just I, I know about them. He's I know them. And my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and pure when you judge. Again, once again, when David is acknowledging here against you, you only have I sinned, any sin, any judgment of wrong whatsoever does not exist if there is no, no existence of God. If God does not exist, there's no transcendent good to judge anything or to be judged by. And, and, and David is acknowledging right here that unlike in many people's thoughts today, that is that I'm only guilty if I'm caught understanding this. When we sin, when we violate the law of God, we are caught. All the time, in every place. Because we can never escape the purview of God. He's against you, I've sinned. Anything that I've done that anyone else, against anyone else that is wrong, it is because it's a violation against you. And if, if you don't exist, we don't have this wrong. There's nothing wrong with anything. And now the facts of this case that is presented here in Psalm 51 with David... They include the fact that God knew of David's sin before David confesses. But the facts are also there that David confesses. God knew it, but David confesses. David had committed his sin and sought to keep it secret until God sends Nathan, as the, the, the four notes say, send Nathan the prophet to confront him. David's response was not to try to hide it, not to try to excuse it, but his response was a confession of his sin, as we see here. A plea for the mercy of God in forgiveness, as we see here and in Psalm chapter 6, if you were to look at that. And a recognition of the justice of God regarding sin. When we are regularly confessing our sin before God, we are heightening our sensitivity to sin and our increasing awareness of our own weakness. Listen, church. It, it, it makes no sense to try to hide our sin before God. When we go to Him in prayer, we're going to ask Him about this, and yet we know we've got this sin behind us. Do we think, if I don't bring any attention to it, God won't think about it? I think that's what we think. But when we're approaching Him on something else that's heavy on our hearts, if we have in us the habit of being honest and confessing our sin in that moment, in that moment the right light begins to shine on even the request we have been motivated initially to come to Him about. And we are more apt to be conformed to His will regarding that thing when we're confessing that sin. And when we're confessing that sin, we are also being enlightened as to the depth of our own weakness as mere human beings. In, in 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, John is bringing out the necessity of this confession of sin. And he says there, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. 
In verse 10 of 1 John chapter 1, he says, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. It is crucial that we recognize our sin and its persistence in our lives while in this flesh. But sandwiched right smack dab in between these two verses is the promise that David himself was resting on in Psalm 51. And in verse 9 of 1 John chapter 1, right again between those two verses, he writes this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? It's, a, it's, it's that sandwich. We've got to know we're sinners. We can't deny our sin. But the goody in this is that if we confess our sin, he's righteous and just to forgive us. We will not confess our sins, nor make it a habit to confess our sins before the Lord without in the process realizing our own inherent weakness in our flesh and our eternal need for his protection, his strength, his discernment. We need this constantly flowing, constantly flowing in us. In the latest edition of a, a little periodical magazine that, that I receive, and some of you may receive, it's called The Voice of the Martyrs. It's a ministry, Voice of the Martyrs magazine. A man, uh, an account of a man who had grown up in Baghdad, Iraq, in a Catholic family while he was growing up there, before the, the, the Saddam Hussein days and then through the, the Saddam Hussein days as well. He was struggling between... Islamic claims and the claims of Christianity, specifically with regard to whether the Bible was really the Word of God. Because in that environment, I mean, it's, it's a predominantly, it was a, it's a Muslim country, and so he's hearing, you know, uh, the polemics against Christianity in the Bible, and he's, he's hearing the apologist for the Quran and uh, Hadiths and what have you. After his friend he's engaged with has faithfully answering his questions with regard to the authenticity, uh, the veracity of the Bible, the friend he was challenging on this issue challenged him in return. And he challenged him to stop thinking about what God wants from me and to start thinking about what I need from God. As I read this to Rena yesterday or the day before, I've said, this is profound. This is, this, whoever this friend was had a right understanding of a gospel ministry to lost people. Right? Got it in your, got it in your, your, your candy machine. Uh, you need to understand you're going to him because you need, you need him. Nor is he, nor is he this, this judge up there that's, that's, charging you to meet certain criteria for him. You can't do that. Why? Because what is required to have an eternal communion, live eternally in heaven with God, is his own perfect righteousness. You can't, you can't do that. So stop thinking that way as well. Think about what you need from God. What happened then, Hatham, this, this individual, then asked his friend, what he, what, what he thought, so he says, what do you think my utmost need is? And his friend responded to him that it was the same for every human being on the planet. And that is that he was a sinner and that he needed God to save him from his sins. The friend then shared the gospel. And, and though Hatham initially, when the friend started trying to share the gospel with him, he had told him I, he didn't need to hear the story about Jesus again because he already, he already knew that. But in light of the reality of his own sin and his need for the grace and mercy of God, he now listened to his friend and understood the account of Jesus that he had heard so many times before somehow, but he never received it in that day he received it and he experienced it as he had never heard, never heard or experienced it before. The point is that the recognition of his sin and not the petition of his own desires or a dependence upon his own efforts as both Islam and the Catholic religion teach is what brought this man 
to the fullness of the gospel in salvation. Now, Brother Shane is going to be baptized after the service this morning, and he and I were talking, and I hope not to be stealing any thunder here, but you can say it again. But he told me the other day as we were talking that what struck him was last week. I asked him, when did you come to faith in Christ? Well, last Sunday afternoon sometime. He was looking, reading, and it came to be a, just a reality in his mind. He's a sinner. He was a sinner before God, and he needed to be saved. We will do well to be sober-minded regarding our own sinful natures still abiding in our flesh when we go to our Lord in prayer. Remember Romans chapter 7. We're not going to go back to that, but remember Romans chapter 7. Paul himself is acknowledging his own weakness while still in the flesh. As pastors, we are, we are not in a separate echelon of Christians, as some people tend, tend to think with regard to the standard of holiness before God. We're all held to the same standard of holiness before God, every single one of us. The qualifications of a pastor or elder are simply, be, simply to be exemplary to all Christians or of all Christians. With certain, in the, in the 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 passages, in, t in terms of the qualifications that are listed there, there are certain particularity there with regard to men uh, fulfilling our roles within the home and, and within the church, for sure. But apart from that, the standards of holiness are the same for everyone there. The character is, of the person is supposed to exemplify biblical Christianity. What this means is that the men who are placed in these roles within the church are to exemplify these standards before and not after, but before being given this office. Correct? Correct? We've been through this before. So everyone should be maturing into that kind of uh, life observed as a Christian, correct? Everyone. This is, these standards are there for everyone, correct? So then, any warning to pastors or elders written through the ages by the leaders of the church down through the ages would be wisely heeded by anyone in the church, correct? Correct. Good answer. In Spurgeon's lectures to my students... He quotes Richard Baxter, the Puritan, as he teaches on the minister's self-watch. Now, I want to say this. This is, this is going to be somewhat of a lengthy quote. But as we read it, I believe you will see the incredible clarity, uh, the insight, and, and feel the gravity of this warning. First of all, to pastors. That's who he's directly addressing. But then to any Christian who is desiring to have a life that impacts any other person, who is in any kind of leadership whatsoever. And again, we desire to be a discipling church, right? An evangelistic and a discipling church. So we expect every true believer of Christ in this church to be discipling somebody, to be applying your life to theirs in helping them grow in their faith in Christ. He writes this, Spurgeon is quoting, Take heed to yourselves, says, says Baxter, because the tempter will make his first and sharpest onset upon you. If you will be the leaders against him, he will spare you no further than God restraineth him. He beareth you the greatest malice that are engaged to do him the greatest mischief. As he hateth Christ more than any of us, because he is the general of the field and the captain of our salvation, and doth more than all the world besides against the kingdom of darkness, so doth he note the leaders under him more than the common soldiers on the like account in their proportion. He knows what a rout he may make among the rest if the leaders fall before their eyes. This should be an appeal for you guys to continuously pray for us. He says, he's going on, Take heed, therefore, brethren, for the enemy hath a special eye upon you. You shall have his most subtle insinuations and incessant solicitations and violent assaults. As wise and learned as you are, take heed to yourself, selves, lest he overwit you. 
The devil is a greater scholar than you and a nimbler disputant. He can transform himself into an angel of light to deceive. He will get within you and trip up your heels before you are aware. He will play the juggler with you undiscerned. In other words, distracting you. And cheat you of your faith or innocency. And you shall not know that you have lost it. Here's the weightiest part. You will not see hook nor line, much less the subtle angler himself, while he is offering you his bait. And his baits shall be so fitted to your temper and disposition that he will be sure to find advantages within you. And whenever he ruineth you, he will make you the instrument of your own ruin. We need to recognize in prayer our own sins and our own weakness before God. Anyone who is honest with themselves and before God knows the accuracy of this admonition from Richard Baxter. And it's frightening when we think about it. Rodney Williams and I were talking uh, the other day and I told him that I, I, I know a, I, when I know a circumstance is coming up that I'm particularly because of my temperament may be vulnerable to, I typically don't have a challenge with that because I get prayed up for it, right? It's those, those things that are so, so tailored to my weaknesses that hit me blindsidedly. That I, out of nowhere, they hit me from, from left field. And it is devastating. It is absolutely devastating. I, and Baxter was right in that what I find is that the situation in which I am experiencing failure, as subtle as it may be to other people, is debilitatingly, perfectly tailored for my weaknesses. You may not have a challenge in that area. And all of a sudden, the enemy, he's got me. He has got me. And while others may not see these, these certain failures in my life as big deals, it is devastating to me personally because I am faced with the reality that I wasn't prayed up for it because I was resting on my laurels. Counting whatever my previous victories were experienced as signals of self-sufficiency instead of constantly being self-aware of my need for His strength and protection and wisdom and discernment. I, and I'm not absolved from responsibility through a claim of ignorance. None of us are. We know ourselves. We know ourselves. We know ourselves. And our enemy knows us as well. He studies us. And Paul alludes to our knowledge of our own weaknesses and propensities in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, when he says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes, his plans, his devices against us. In this letter to the Corinthians, Paul is expending a great deal of energy seeking to compel these guys to keep their focus on the end game. If you go back and read 2 Corinthians, he wants them to keep an eternal perspective and not to get sidetracked by worldly distractions or moral failures. In chapter 4 of that letter to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians verses 16 to 18, he writes, Therefore we do not lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For our momentary light affliction is working out for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. He's trying to get them. Look, guys, you need to understand, you're going to have these challenges. We know, we know that the enemy is going to attack us based on our weaknesses. You need to be prepared for this. And the way you're going to be prepared for this is, is, under, is keeping an eternal perspective. Don't get, don't get allured by these things. When we fall prey to the schemes of the devil against us, we lose sight of that eternal glory that Paul is speaking of. 
But spending time in prayer, confessing not only our sins before God, but also our known and yet unknown vulnerabilities. We are better prepared for the schemes we know are being devised by our enemy against us. I want to tell you, there have been multiple times in my life where all of a sudden I've gotten hit. I find out I'm vulnerable in an area I had not previously realized. Don't think that you have searched out all possibilities of the circumstances and situations that you might find yourself in and think you can go on on only past experiences and pray only in that way. We are wise in our prayers when we go before Him going, God, I, I don't know what the enemy sees, but I know you know. I'm asking you to protect me. Strengthen me. Give me the discernment. Keep me from that. In Psalm 38, verses 12 to 22, we read, Those who search for my life lay snares for me, and those who seek to do me evil have threatened destruction, and they meditate on deception all day long. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. And I am like a mute man who does not open his mouth. And I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no reproofs. For I wait on you, Yahweh. You will answer, O Lord my God. For I said, save, lest they be glad over me, who, when my foot stumbles, magnify themselves against me. For I am ready to fall, and my sorrow is continually before me. For I confess my iniquity. I am full of anxiety because of my sin, but my enemies are vigorous and strong, and those who wrongfully hate me abound, and those who repay evil for good, they accuse me, for I pursue what is good. Do not forsake me, O Yahweh, O my God. Do not be far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. This was a psalm of David in his struggle over known sins and the desire to live a godly life in the midst of the enemies of his soul. You see there his only hope is confessed in that last verse to be the Lord as his salvation. This, that is not a um, synergistic work. God alone is a salvation. It's not God plus David. In Psalm 139, David once again is preemptive in his prayers as he asks for God to show him where he is weak and failing. In Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, he writes there, pleading, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. When I was right, in, right out of high school, I worked road construction. And one of the things that I found was that there, are, there were places on that road where we were building that and doing all the dirt work where our big machines, our backhoes and, and, and uh, motor graders or what have you, the heavy stuff would go across certain sections and we would see and the inspectors would see the sponginess there. On the top, before any pressure was put on it, it looked good. It looked fine. It had that class 10 dirt on there, and it looked good. But when those heavy, that heavy equipment went across it, there was a sponginess to it, and it came back. What was revealed by the pressure was that there was muck down below. And more than one section of that, that like eight-mile stretch of road that I worked on there during that time frame, the only answer... The only, the only remedy was to pull that expensive class 10 dirt that they had brought in, pull it off of there, take a backhoe, and dig down and pull out this nasty, rotten muck down in there to try to get all of that muck out and get it away, let that dry out, and then fill it back in with some solid, sure stuff and then put that class 10 back on there and build the road so that it wouldn't fall apart later under ongoing stress. And oftentimes I'm praying, I'm praying this very prayer right here, but in my mind I'm asking God to muck me out. Because what may look good on the surface, I know that under pressure it's going to cave. 
It's not going to withstand the pressure. And I'm asking him, God, reach down. Lay me open like a Christmas turkey. Reach down inside of me. Grab that muck. Pull it out before my face. That's what he's asking. Show me my weakness. And then get it away from me. To keep me humble and dependent upon him. David was a warrior king. And he knew the importance of learning his vulnerabilities from God about himself before they got exploited by the enemy. And these are the things we need to know and that we need to be constantly engaging in prayer about. How, how do we know the weaknesses we can, be readily, we can readily confess right now except by the experience of failure in those areas before? The things that we know about only come because we've experienced them before. But God knows what lays ahead of us. He knows them before we manifest them. So it would do us well to commit ourselves and submit ourselves to Him in utter dependence to lead us away from these areas. That is what our Lord is teaching when He is teaching. And again, the disciples' prayer, what so often is called the Lord's Prayer, when He's teaching how to pray in verse 13 of that, Matthew chapter 6 passage he says and do not lead us into temptation but deliver us from the evil one god lead us away from temptation is what he's asking deliberately it's there the enemy has it lead us away from that i spent many years as a christian thinking i had to conquer temptation for god when I learned this truth right here, that Jesus Christ, God the Son, has just given me this gift to say, these temptations, you don't, you don't fight them. These temptations, you come to me. You, you, put, you place your heart and soul and body and mind on the altar of worshiping and trusting me to deal with it. When I learned that, it is amazing what I witnessed in my life and God dissipating those oncoming temptational situations. Look, if you're a nation anywhere through history needing to defend itself and you are pretty much impenetrable by ground forces, but you don't have a strong air defense and you're facing an enemy that knows this fact about you, where do you think they're going to try to hit you? What kind of attack do you think they're going to launch? It's going to be an air attack, unless they're fools. We all have such glaring weaknesses in one way or another as mere human beings, glaring to such a foe as the demonic forces that we do battle against. Maybe not to everybody else, but they're glaring to them, and they're arrayed against us to address those weaknesses. Again, some of them may not be so obvious to us or to other people, but the type of real enemies that we have in the spiritual realm, they're not flesh and blood, and they see them quite well. But by the grace and mercy of God, we aren't trapped in those weaknesses as long as we are putting our trust in Him who has no weaknesses. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 4, John writes there, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them. Because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Confessing our sins and recognizing our weaknesses before God and throwing ourselves before his mercy and expressing our utter dependence upon him should be inseverable, interwoven into our times of prayer. That doesn't mean, again, that we're praying all these things every single time we pray, but it does mean, again, that if someone's looking at our, our prayer life as a fabric, a tapestry, if you will. These things are not to be seen as a mere fringe on the edge, but part of the body of that. And a right smack dab in the center of that proverbial tapestry of our prayer lives is not our glory as confessing our sins or weaknesses will tend to keep the illusion of self-glory at bay but the glory and majesty of God Himself. 
As Jesus taught us how to pray in the Sermon on the Mount, He told us to recognize that God is not confined to His creation or dependent upon it, but transcendent to it majestically. He said as much when He told us to speak to, uh, of God as our Father, as the one who is in heaven. We are praying to one when we pray in such a way who is not only unaffected by the wickedness, the chaos that we see in this world, but is sovereignly turning every single wickedness to conform to His plan, and which will ultimately evidence His glory, both the good and the bad. Whatever evil we see, how, however evil it is, it will ultimately evidence His glory in the end, though we cannot, we cannot possibly comprehend how all of those things will do that. Isaiah spoke of seeing the Lord not on earth, but high and lifted up in heaven. In Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 there, Isaiah records, he says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, with the train of His robe filling the temple. In the Septuagint, the train of His robe is actually the word for glory. His glory filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. Not parts of it. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook to, at the voice of him who called out. While the, the house of God was filling with smoke, then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people of, a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh of hosts. Glory to God in my weakness. It is always helpful for me to meditate in my prayers on the fact that my God, the God I am praying to is so far above all this mess that He is, on the one hand, He's untouched by it. I may be touched. He's untouched by it. He can't be touched by it. And yet, on the other hand, He has intimate knowledge of my weakness in this, in this world, in these circumstances, and has put himself in my place in this world here on this very earth as a human being in order to take on so much more than I could ever imagine facing in this world by taking the full wrath of the Father on our behalf on that cross to save us who will believe in him. In Hebrews chapter 4. Verses 14 and 16, the writer says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us take hold of our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things like we are yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help time help in the time of need. We see there the, 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 come, the bringing together of this transcendent, majestic glory of our God and Lord. At the same time, this one who has made himself absolutely intimate with every weakness and vulnerability that we have. Yet in perfection. In our prayers, it is proper and good to, as Jesus said, hallow his name, to make it holy in our hearts. His name is eternally holy. We don't, we don't give it something that it doesn't already exist, that it doesn't already possess. But this is Jesus, uh, that Jesus speaking of, uh, of this is an act of worship. And, and, and I'm not sure that in our, in our current Jesus is my homeboy culture, that we are predisposed to engage in this kind of prayer a great deal. But this is what is called a practice of doxology. And doxology is just a fancy word meaning simply glory speaking. It's a combination of two Greek words, doxa meaning glory, and logos in this context meaning speaking, glory speaking. And listen to David's prayer as he responds in a doxology to the gifts 
from God's people toward the building of the temple. Look what he says. So David blessed Yahweh in the sight of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, our Father, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Yahweh, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Indeed, everything that is in the heavens and on the earth Yours is the kingdom, O Yahweh, and you exalt yourself as head over all. Both riches and honor come from you, and you rule over all, and in your hand is power and might, and it lies in your hand to make great and to strengthen everyone. So now, our God, we are thanking you and praising your glorious name. There are many doxologies in the New Testament, just, but just as a sampling to close out. It might help us to think a little bit more intentionally about bringing this practice into our prayer lives. Here, here are a couple that Paul wrote to Timothy in his pastoral letters to Timothy, instructively preparing in those letters the New Testament church for the future beyond the apostolic ministries. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17, he says to Timothy, Now to the, to the king of, a, of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever amen so be it so be it and in second timothy a second letter to timothy chapter 4 verse 18 the lord will rescue me from every evil deed and will save me unto his heavenly kingdom to him be the glory forever and ever amen and lastly to close out with a doxology that pulls together the points of powerful prayer that we have covered today jude Verses 24 and 25, Jude writes there, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling in your weakness and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, his mercy and grace, his righteousness placed upon us through faith. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sin. Let us keep a growing awareness of our weakness and our dependence upon God. And let us worship Him in our prayer. Church, these few things and more will empower us personally, individually, and as a church. It's so easy to take it for granted because it is so readily available to us. Or is it? We can list these things out. I could put them on a screen here again. Just these three elements. Confessing sin, acknowledging our weakness, and glorifying Him making hallow His name. I could put those on the screen. But there is a great chasm from knowledge to practice in the typical human heart. And the first thing we can do is pray that the Holy Spirit would bridge that gap today in our lives. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you. I believe with all my heart in this moment that I have many brothers and sisters in Christ in this room right now that are joining me in thankfulness for this gift of prayer. Lord God, that you would stir in us to, to commit in our minds, to desire in our minds that this atrophy that we, we, we may have experienced would be overcome with strengthening. God, that, that, that you, would, you would put in us a desire to do what we need to do not just acknowledge what we need to do, but to actually engage 
desire to be strengthened by you through this, this medium of prayer that you have gifted us with. And let, that, that, Lord, our faith would grow. Our faith would grow to believe, to exercise this, to utilize it, to engage, but that also through being conformed to your will, we actually see your will miraculously, providentially bring, being brought about and thereby our faith strengthens even more. God, I'm praying for a strong church. I'm also praying, Lord God, that for those that have not truly hated their sin, come to that point of hating it so as to desire to turn away from it, to turn to you. I pray, Lord, you're moving those hearts this morning and that even this very moment, they are in, in, the, in the place they're sitting, confessing their sin to you. Realizing as Shane did, I am a sinner. I, I, I am in need of forgiveness and salvation. And that as Shane did, they can't keep it in. They've got, they've got to let someone know. They've got to profess what has been confessed. Follow through with this testimony of baptism. Exemplifying Dying to self, dying to sin, being buried with Christ and being raised to new life in Him. God, I pray that that's happening where that need lies in this room this morning. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Instead of observing the Lord's Supper as we normally do, as I have spoken much already this morning, we are going to observe baptism. But as they prepare, we are going to sing uh, our, our closing song, and then TJ will close us out after the baptism.